everything power up, start streaming, and uh, we'll be coming to you here in just one second. Got a great show lined up for you tonight. Lots and lots of information. So again, just give us one second here while we get powered up. Good. All right. All right, guys. Welcome to the show, and welcome back. I am your host, Nate Zielinski. Uh, huge thanks to Botech for letting us go live from their page, as always, for providing the live stream platform. Uh, you might also be watching from the Diamond Facebook page, as well as Nate Zielinski, Bass Pro Shops of Denver. Huge thanks for them to go on live with us, uh, as well as Tightline Outdoors. So again, no matter where you're watching from, hopefully you're going to find extremely educational information tonight. I'll tell you what, I've been waiting a long time for tonight's show. Uh, it's one of those things that... Once we do our scouting, once we become successful, this is the absolute next step. Uh, and for a lot of people nowadays, what we're going to talk about tonight is the entire reason uh, for hunting. Beyond the entertainment value, beyond the, the you know, traditions of hunting, uh, it's all about that organic meat. So uh, that's what we're all going to talk about tonight. Real quick before we get into the night show, uh, I've been talking about scouting. Obviously, I've been trying to start each show with where I personally have been with my scouting. Uh, I've been putting a lot of focus on bighorn sheep that I'm going on those couple hunts here, actually starting next week with a couple of friends of mine, uh, as well as putting a lot of emphasis on pronghorn as that season starts uh, here in just a couple of weeks in the middle of August. Uh, the sheep thing's going very well. These animals have been working uh, about a two to three mile grid, but the animals are, are staying true to patterns. Uh, located a lot of sheep so everything's kind of going very well with that uh hopefully uh coming up here next weekend and next week we'll have great opportunity to, a close range and a close opportunity at those sheep and have you some footage for you from that uh the pronghorn thing has been up and down we've seen a lot of big pronghorns very excited about it uh we've got a ton of rain in colorado where i personally have my hunt um and that rain's really changed up the whole water hole situation where we talk about it. I'm personally not a huge water hole guy. I'd rather spot and stock, but I still always have that backup plan of hunting water. Uh, and with all the rain, these animals are not drinking as much because they're getting moisture from the grass. And more importantly, now every little indentation in the earth, a rock, a side of a road, has water in it right now. So these animals are getting water on a daily basis, on an hourly basis, and not as... Uh, as repetitive on the water holes that they have been. So really putting even more emphasis on spotting and walk next to these animals uh, to do that. So uh, stay tuned for that. Again, make sure you stay tuned to the Nate Zielinski Facebook page, uh, that fan page there, and we'll walk you through what we've been doing through the scouting process uh, to be successful on that. But with without further ado, I have to invite my good friend, Steve Hein, right now in the studio, guys. This is a big deal. If you, no matter where you're at, I don't care if you're East Coast, New York, you're California on the West Coast, more than likely, if you haven't heard of it, you know a hunter who has had meat processed at Steve's Meat Market. Now, I, I know that we, we talk about this. I, I kind of toot your horn. You say, you know, you're just the meat cutter. But you've processed animals from all across the country. All across, I mean, yeah. people bring it to you. I mean, country musicians, TV hosts. I mean, yeah. you've had it all. I mean, oh, yeah. I've literally seen tour buses many times, not just once, many times parked in front of your shop. Yeah, we've been lucky. We have a, been, a great clientele. Absolutely. So... Literally, the, the man, the legend is in studio, and I wanted to bring you because you have the most experience of anybody I know with wild game processing on top of the actual hunting. Now, there's a lot of processors that are more, you know, hey, they own a restaurant and they do some meat cutting on the side. Right. You've hunted all across the world. I mean, you're enthusiast. You've done Africa. You've done brown bears. I mean, you've done all the hunting. So you understand both sides. You right. know, I think a lot of people don't quite understand maybe both concepts, and you are the guy that has... All that experience of everything. Now, Steve's Meat Market right here in Arvada, Colorado. Correct. I want to talk about the shop real quick because, again, sure. we, we talk about this, and I think when people hear about processing, there's some smaller shops out there. There's some big shops out there. But the volume that goes through a processor when you're in a, a good state with good hunting, with good opportunity, I like to talk about the the, the business real quick because I think so many people, I, I've been in line at your shop, you know, picking up stuff and people complain about something, you know, oh, it took too long. Oh, it took it this. Is, sure. I don't think people understand the, the volume. So we were talking earlier, how many pounds of meat go through your, your shop in, in the hunting season? I mean, that carcasses, there'll be 5,000, something like that, about a half a million half pounds, million pounds of carcasses of coming carcass in. Carcass coming right. in. And, uh, you know, every year it seems like we always do a little over 90 tons of sausage. 90 tons of sausage get processed <laughs> through your shop. Now, we were talking salt the other day because you're, you're right now, you're in full-blown promotion. You know, hunting season hasn't started yet, but you're right. getting ready. You're mixing salt. How long does it take and how much salt 
or spices? Get the involved. spices uh, were lined up for this year is uh, around 34,000 pounds. 34,000 pounds of spices to yeah. process meat. It takes uh, three of us about close to a month to just, blend just them. To they're, 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 yeah, they're all recipes that I started with uh, many years ago and uh, just fine-tuned them. And we're real meticulous on creating the same product every year. If you like my breakfast sausage this year, you'll like it again next year. Absolutely. Because I want consistency. No, and to me, that has to be the, the key ingredient. Absolutely. I think the other thing I want to talk about, too, is, is creativity. So... As a hunter, so, you know, my family, between my wife, myself, you know, we'll have five, six, seven animals, eight animals on a given year, you know, between all the hunts that we do. And I talk to every hunter out there, and you run into all those guys that are like, man, elk, I would, I would eat elk over a cow, over anything, all day long. And let's face it, if you actually are the person that eats it every day, it can get old. So for me personally, you know, I, I live on wild game. But I can't have the same burger steak roast sure. every day. So my kids love hot dogs. What three-year-old doesn't like hot dogs? Like a ballpark Frank, like a bratwurst. If you can buy it in the grocery store, and we're saying that style of meat, you can buy it at your shop. I mean, well, well, no, we don't sell it. You don't sell it, but I'm we, saying we make you can it process right. it. You can You're get right. it processed. So, I mean, hot dogs. Yeah, you got style Frank. I yeah. mean, brats, cheddar dogs, yeah. all the jerky, jalapeno cheddar. Jalapeno cheddar. I mean, how many cuts do you have? Oh, I don't, 17, I believe, yeah. maybe even more. Breakfast, a few years ago, we added breakfast links. Yep, so you have breakfast links and bulk. You got yeah. Italian for making spaghetti. And casings on the Italian yep. sausage and snack sticks. Uh, people will come and ask you for things, and you're like, I don't want to go that direction. Yep. Snack sticks was a tough one for me just because uh, – the machine that it takes to extrude a snack stick. Yep. I could give you the recipe, <laughs> and if you don't have the equipment to extrude it properly, because yep. ours pulls the air out, okay. it's a vacuum stuffer, so it's pulling a vacuum and, and stuffing it, so therefore it doesn't make the quality of product. Yep. So even with yep. the recipe, you can go to buy all this little equipment to yeah, make yeah. it yourself at home, and you're still not going to be successful. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. I mean, there, there's an art to it, there's, and I think everybody out there has done the processing, and then they go try it themselves, and always last couple of years, and they come back and they're it's, like, boy, that's not exactly what I thought it was going to be. It's tough. You know? But, you know, that's how I started. Absolutely. You know, my Absolutely. dad had a restaurant, and I started doing game just because I wanted something better than what was out there. Yeah. Definitely. And that's what I started. I've never done anything but boneless cuts and vacuum packaging. I never paper racked. Yep. Because I didn't want my stuff paper racked. So that's kind of the direction I went. I never looked at the price that other people charged. Yep. I just said, this is what I have to charge to yep. stay in business. Yep. And it's been overwhelming. Um, the line is long, but if you go to any good restaurant at night, it's usually busy. <laughs> if it's not busy, if, if it's you a go, good idea. If you go to your processor and you can get right in, there's probably, right probably a reason for that, you know. And, I mean, so I've been, I've been, I think I looked up the other day, I think my very first time coming to you was 17 years ago. I think it was sure. my first time coming to the shop. Sure. And in 17 years of processing, I would say a minimum of three animals a year. I don't think I have ever once found a hair in anything. <laughs> well, I just want to say that because I guided for 10 years. Mm -hmm. I guided in a northwest portion of the state. I used other processors for our customers when we were guiding up there because they had to be in and out. And I would yeah. watch some of these processors shift animals in. And everybody else never got alarmed. But every animal that leaves your shop, you're pressure washed. I mean, if your truck pulls through, yeah. You pressure wash. I mean, well, you can we clean eat them yeah. off of anything in your shop. I mean, everything is flawlessly clean. And that's another thing that I like to point out is the operation is, is huge. And people don't realize that. You know, you go to other processors and I watch this animal that's, you know, bloated and nasty and got hair on it. And it's laying on the table and on the floor. And then the next animal's on there. And it's just like a smorgasbord of, of filth. And everything is clean. They can shop. be that way. And if... A person's, you know, looking to sort out a processor yep. for wherever part of the state they're in. Um, we're all inspected. All processors in Colorado yep. have to be USDA inspected. And um, that's public record. Yep. So if you just go online and, and see how the inspection went on the guy last year <laughs> or the last five years, see what he was, yeah. see if he's an A or, or not. Absolutely. You know, and that's that should guide you. I can't do every animal in the world. Yep. I mean, I'm very content right where we're at. Absolutely. And uh, we've got a good name, and I want to keep it like that. But... Uh, yeah, if you if you can't do that, then you end up doing no, it yourself. Absolutely, you know? I, definitely. And I we, just, we, again, we strive for that. I'm be, by beyond impressed with you. everything you've done. So thank you. For, absolutely. But again, you got to check it out. Now make sure you just you know, again, if you're watching this, 
make sure you write it down. Steve's Meat Market, especially if you're here in Colorado, Wyoming, Utah, you want that meat processed the highest quality, swing by, give them a call. You know, sort it out ahead of time, or, like right now. Just our, web, our website. Website. Our go, website go is website. very informative, and we have a link that goes yep. to uh, Larimer University, okay. and it talks all about aging game, boning game, the yields off of game, yep. and uh, that's very good. It's very informative to the Absolutely. Guy. So again, what's the website? Steve's Meat Market, www.com, Steve's Meat Perfect. Market. Steve's Market, Steve's Meat Market, and interest, com. Interesting links, and you'll go to the Laramie Hookup, yeah. Perfect. and it should give you all sorts of real information. That's awesome. Again, just, again, a part of the scouting. We talk scouting, prep, this is what it's all about. You know, when that animal is down, a lot of us that are watching this are going to harvest an animal every single year. A lot of us watching this is going to be the first one. And I think people that are used to not being successful, mm -hmm. when all of a sudden it happens, a lot of them are like, whoa, exactly. It I happened. didn't plan on this. I didn't quite plan on this. You know, so talk to your meat processors like we talked to our taxidermists ahead of time. Talk to the processor, know how he wants it. Now, we're going to walk you through all that tonight. So, now, Steve, the, the moral of the story, we talked about the shop. Now it's time to get down and dirty. Sure. So, we've been talking prep like we just talked about. I want to walk everything from literally from slipping that arrow through the animal or putting a bullet through it to where I'm eating it on my table. This is the time when good meat can become better or poor meat can still be great. But there's a lot of times where good meat goes bad sure. in the preparation that hunters take. And the, the lack of preparation. The, the lack of preparation, absolutely. So right now we're talking, it, it's just going into August. August is tomorrow. Sheep hunt start on the 5th. Pronghorn start on the 15th. And deer is starting, you know, in the next couple weeks. You know, depending on where you're at, there's some elk hunts that start next week. Um, so animals are going to start being on the ground. There's a lot of these early season hunts that it might be 90 degrees. It might be 100 degrees. Mm -hmm. So that's the first concept that we're going to talk about tonight is I got an animal on the ground. Walk me through it. I mean, we're number one, skin on, skin off. You hear everything. We just talked about that before the show. Exactly. Uh, people are like, oh, yeah, leave skin on so it stays clean. I want to talk about that. But I want to talk about the first steps I take, especially in temperature. Uh, if we're out hunting and it, uh, August is our uh, warm month and the earth is still warm, so you can't leave that animal on the ground. But if you're a bow hunter and you just tagged an animal, uh, one thing I want to clarify, first of all, if you're hunting in Colorado, that's the time you take your license out, tear it in half, sign it, punch it, and we're ready to go. Now you've got a properly... Uh, validated carcass tag. Um, there's three methods. If you're hunting close to the road or your camp, uh, traditionally you'll drag the carcass back, hang it up in a tree, skin it. That's beautiful. Yeah. If you're next to a river, it's going to be a little bit cooler. I think it's very important, I know it's important, to get the uh, hide off of that animal. We want to get it there and cool it. It doesn't hurt if you got to uh, hang that whole animal and drop a few blocks of ice in the chest cavity or frozen uh, milk jugs, anything plastic like that. And that uh, it's only in the rib cage, but it's going to transfer. That cold air will suck up to the legs. It'll okay. help cool the, the neck and everything down. And you've got the hide off of it. That's an ideal situation, but your avid Not guys... Not going to be for everybody. <laughs> no. If you're, if you're avid, you want that exceptional animal, you're up in the high country. And you're probably hunting by yourself. I never had any luck hunting with somebody bold. <laughs> I mean, it's, I tried it with my wife and oh, son, yeah. and it was just too much noise. So therefore... Uh, a lot of people do what they call the gutless method, yep. and it's it's a favorite of mine. Yep, like no messy back there. Exactly. Yep. Another thing that gutless method works well for is that it's late at night. You just shot an animal, especially an elk. Nothing's going to happen fast. So that's uh, pretty simple. Yep. If you, I think people are intimidated by it. I believe Nate's going to release. Yeah, we're going to have a video here just real shortly next week, if not two weeks. Uh, well, basically a three minute breakdown of the No Mess Field Dress. So guys, you can stay tuned for that. There's also some great stuff on YouTube. I mean, you look up No Mess Field Dress, you'll you'll see some good things there. Watch a few of those those programs. And uh, basically, what it, uh, I like to do, the animals laying on one side or the other, and I'll start right up uh, between the uh, ears and make a con continuous cut straight down the spine all the way to the tail. Yep. Peel off that hide on the side that's up. So now you have the loin, and I call it the loin, it's the whole thing. It, it really isn't all loin steaks, you know. Yep. That front end, the neck meat and stuff could be roast or burger. But just leave it in one long strip. Go straight down the spine and then go to 90 degrees off of the ribs where they come up and those two points will come together along the spine. You've pulled out the loin. Um, at that time, you can take off the front shoulder and the rear, the hind leg of the other section, pull off some uh, additional brisket meat if you want to. I don't think it's uh, mandatory anymore in Colorado. So now you've, you've completed that one side, but before you want to turn the carcass over, 
Um, you can reach in right behind the last rib, push down, make a small cut behind the last rib, and work that inside tenderloin out. That's a very valuable piece of meat. Absolutely. I mean, it's about a hundred dollars for one inside tender. <laughs> if you if you were to Google and try yeah, to buy yeah. one, uh, so a buffalo or an elk that's about a hundred dollar piece of tenderloin. You've completed that side. The other thing is, if you just shot a trophy animal. You've already made your first cut, going, going right down there. Yep. And um, if you're going to prepare any animal uh, for your taxidermist, you're going to stay way behind. I'd say the middle of the belly. It's better to have too much height yep. than not enough height. And you're going to make one barrel cut that runs all the way around the animal. So we've completed the one side. Before I start removing those pieces, I'll try to find a pine tree real close and handy with some little uh, dead limbs sticking off of okay. it. And I'll take that loin and drape it over there. The hind, I'll stick it on another one in the front on a different one. Don't put those in plastic bags or stack it up. The other thing that I, I can see that's worse that people will do right away, that same method, they're not leaving the bone in it, and they make a lot of small pieces, yep. and they pack it in a duffel bag. <laughs> and it's just become the heat's trapped in. Yep. You'll see that animal, even on a warm day, it starts to develop a skin on the outside, yep. and that's good. Yep. That skin's okay. going to protect it a little bit. Um, if you start to see flies start to gather, you don't you don't want them. I see a lot of. I can't believe how many guys use a game bag and they leave it open and they're putting pieces in, yeah. and the flies are in there. Yeah. And then when they get done, they they tie it up. It's like tie, jail for the it's flies. Like, it's like me going to a buffet and you lock me in at <laughs> yeah. night. And so yeah, keep the flies out of the game bag. Absolutely. And um, you return the old animal over repeat the process on the other side. If an animal is bloated somewhat on you, you can you can relieve the pressure by sticking them in the belly with your knife, yep. and then it, you'll, it'll be a little smelly, and the stomach will let the air out. Yep. And, and then you can that get that line. inside yep. tenderloin a little bit easier. Caribou yep. do that in the first hour. Yep. Um, so that's, a, that's a, that method. The only one I can say about the boneless, I get one or two guys a year that bring me some nice looking stuff. They're very good at it, but for the most part, it's a lot of work and a lot of waste because they take every little piece and they're, they're dropping it in the dirt or something. I mean, that's the, staying clean is one of the biggest things. And a lot of times if you don't bone out correctly, again, the small pieces, you're dropping them. And again, to, the idea is one, to lose weight, but two, to get that air animal, get that air on it, cool it off. Exactly. And if, if you're stacking it, it immediately takes away the point. Yeah, now, exactly. With bone out, the thing I want to talk about, you okay. know carcasses more than anything. Sure. Let's pretend I'm boning out while we're on that subject real okay. quick. On a deer, sure. I'm up in the high country in my head because all my buddies are like, "You better bone that out." Uh -huh. How much weight am I saving if I bone out a deer, a muley, on my front shoulder? Am I saving 15 pounds no, taking out that bone? About two pounds. About two pounds. Two to three pounds on a shoulder blade of a deer yep. on the front, and on a rear maybe shoulder, or a rear the hind leg, the femur, and that. You, you're going to leave the pelvic bone there. That femur bone probably weighs four or five pounds four or at five the pounds. top. So, and it's easier to handle like a hind leg. Absolutely. If you take the whole hind leg, cut cut it off uh, right below the knee, yep. and get rid of that leg bone, but it's so much easier to put that on your backpack yep. and cinch it down. Have a place to tie it yeah. down. And if you don't have yep. a backpack, you just stick your hand yep. up there, and you can carry this piece of meat a whole lot easier. And it's easier to identify when you go through a check station. Yep. It's easier for me to clean it because yep. I got one big piece. Well, I mean, when I come in and I got guys tell me, oh, I want all the steaks I can get. Anything that isn't at least the size of a small little basketball, yep. I'm saying it's going to be ground because we got to peel the whole thing. Yep. Yep. If, you, if you know how to bone it, like the hind leg has got three major muscle groups, the sections. Okay. There's an inside, a round, uh, outside, or top or a bottom, yep. and then the sirloin tip. Okay. Up on top of that, where it turns and goes up into the, the bone, that's the top sirloin. That's okay. my favorite steak. Yep. That's the tastiest. Yep. Tenderloins are tender, but they have no flavor. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I like it. It just hangs there, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It doesn't do nothing. It doesn't so, do anything. But that's, no, no that's my favorite. Yeah. But that's important to know because, again, I think so many people get caught up in the bone out because that's what they hear. Mm -hmm. Now, there's definitely times where I'm so far back in there and I have a big giant bull mm -hmm. where I do that because I think, hey, you know, that extra 10, 15 pounds is going to put me over the edge. But generally speaking, most cases it doesn't. So the reason we, we talk about this is I want everybody on here to make their best decision of what they should do as far as the bone out. We just lost connection there, Devin. On Evo. Be back on. <clears throat> All right, sorry about that, guys. Um, but I think so many people get hung up on the concept and don't actually even think about how much weight there is. And most of us will carry as much weight as you're doing in bone in water. 
You know what I mean? Everybody fills yes. up their 100-ounce bladder or their 150-ounce sure. bladder, and you know, they don't realize how much weight that is, and that's about the same as that bone out. So, yeah. and again, it, a lot of times, if you don't have to, don't do it. In an elk, you know, there's certainly a difference from a cow to a yeah. big bull, but I'd say those bones are going to be 7 pounds, 8 pounds yeah. per bone so, that you're going to save. So you could save 25 or 30 pounds, yeah. but you're going to get a better yield if, okay. if that's what you're looking for. So, and there's a chance of your whole muscle meat coming out better than, it, than all those little pieces. You're gonna, you might end up with a lot of burger, or you might end up with a lot of loss. Yep, yep definitely. You know? and, and again, that's just something to think about. That's again, talk to your processor and get that information. Because me personally, I've been cutting meat and bringing it to you forever, but I still don't know like those cuts in the back. So when I am taking out that, that hind, let's say I'm taking a deep bone, you know, a hind quarter, I do what's easiest for me to get the bone out. I, I don't even think for a second Okay. What meat should I actually cut off here? And that's what all of a sudden I go to him and I say, hey, I want these steaks. And you're like, Nate, you cut right through them. Well, like, and, 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 and it's because do. I don't know. So, again, the moral of the story is make sure you understand the concept. So if you are going to bone out, make sure you know how to do it. Make sure you know how to break down the hind quarter. If not, get it all to the processor and you're going to get the premium cut of what yeah. you like. And I would assume you could go online and the, the, there's three muscle groups in the hind. Yep. And it's just following the seam. And I'm sure that there's probably a lot of videos out there that, Absolutely. you know, how to debone a hind leg on a deer or an elk. And the muscle groups are the same on, on all species. So they could follow that. Perfect. Absolutely. Now, while we're talking this, so we talked about the three methods, basically, you know, you close the road, take it all out. And then when you take out the animal whole or in quarters or deboned, you talked about blocks of ice and milk jugs. Mm -hmm. But I want to talk about the concept of too much water on these animals. You have a hog in Texas, whatever. I see so many guys that have their animals, whether they're in a game bag or loose in a cooler, and they go into you know Seven Eleven, they come out with three twenty pound bags, sure. and they just start dumping. Sure, you and know it's it's better than nothing. However, a hot animal turns ice cubes into water. Yep, and water carries bacteria. Okay, especially if you have a uh, you shot with a, a a gun or a bow, and you carry that stomach or the paunch up into the exactly. shoulder, and now that's all sitting in the water, and then the water's going to contaminate the whole shooting match. So uh, an easy way to get away from that, we have great coolers nowadays, well insulated, yep. is uh, I, I dedicate one of those, especially if I'm going to someplace like Wyoming, and I'll take a cooler like that, and I'll put one gallon jugs in there, plastic yep. jugs, and then take uh, 20 little water bottles, yep. and fill them up with water and freeze them, and then leave that cooler closed, don't keep looking it's in just there, set it's, it's, uh, we shot some game, and then you can take that, and leave the big jugs in the bottom, yep. and put maybe a shoulder and a hind, yep. and then lace in between that with those other little water okay. jugs. Or the block air come through it. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, or the, well, not so much air, because okay. it's, it's if your cooler's yep. closed. But the thing is, is in the meat industry or the food industry, um, health department wants you to keep pans of anything that you're trying to cool four to six inches thick. Okay. So when you take hind front, neck meat, hind front neck, you might have a 20-inch solid okay. block of hot stuff it's not going to cool. It yeah. wouldn't cool in a commercial cooler, yep. much less that thing that doesn't have any circulation. Absolutely. So if you can lay something in between there, uh, a layered uh, look. Now, if you only got ice cubes and you're coming down from the hills to me or you're going to your house to cut it up, make sure you drain. Keep your, your petcock open on the bottom so that the water's getting out Just of there. Just something to make sure they're not sitting in water. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As the ice melts, it gets out of there yeah. and it's not contaminating everything. Absolutely. And another thing, guys. I tell my boners, you say, why does it look nice and it's clean? I'll tell my boners, they, what, what do you want us to do here? I goes, just pretend the animal that you're on is yours. And then the next one, it's yours. And that's the way you should treat it. If it's got a wound, bloodshot, anything like that, it's going to get thrown away. Why bring it to me? Yep. If the shoulder's bad and you want to take the whole carcass home, cut a big chunk out of there. Anything that you think is... Funny if looking, you don't want to eat hair, it, don't bring it to yeah, me. Hair blood look. clot, yeah. it's like, you know, we're, we charge by the pound, so get rid of that Absolutely. that stuff. It's good for nothing, and it can create a headache. If you have an animal and a, you leave that attached to it, that sourness can transfer to the rest of the animal. Yeah. So if you got one shoulder, one hind, you don't know what to do, at least disconnect it. Separate so, it. Yeah, okay. exactly. So you don't have nothing Yeah, going bad to the rest yeah. of it. Definitely. That, that's great information. And, uh, you know, again, I, I think I talk to people that they think you're the miracle worker. You know, I see it all the time where shoulders shot up. They're like, well, it still weighs five pounds. You know, I'm like, <laughs> man, you, know, you can't put it back together. Like, it's, it's got bonus, bloodshot. And, again, you you want that quality meat, you know. So if you don't think you're going to eat it, more than likely you're not going to process it. Just no, at exactly. At least that portion. So, exactly. Might as well definitely. take it off, throw it away, get rid of it. Absolutely. You know? Now, to talk, I want to talk a little bit more things about rotten meat. So I learned this a couple of years ago. So I was up guiding a steamboat. 
we had a late night. We put a lot of bulls down on our first rifle. It was warm, 80 degrees, and we had chest freezers just stacked up. And every time we put an elk in a chest freezer, we would literally take a chest freezer and put a shoulder in this corner, a shoulder in this corner. And I had a, a brand new guy that was there, and he just put the whole mess in there. So he literally stacked like quarter on quarter on quarter, closed the door. And in his you know defense, he's like, it's a deep freeze. This thing freezes meat in a heartbeat. Put it all in there. Next morning, you know, everything's pretty much getting hard. But as they thawed it out to take it home and take it to the processor, everything in the center was frozen. Well, it was, was green, yeah. nasty. It was, yeah. it was bloated. It was stinky. It couldn't And it cool. rotted out because it couldn't cooler. So, again, people think that once they get to the cooler, once they get to a deep freeze, once they get to wherever, they think that as long as it's in there, it's safe. When in reality, that layering, making sure that the general rule, don't let it touch. I mean, you're, you know, I know we ideally want four inches, yeah. but as long as that meat is separated to where cool air, venting, whatever, can get all the way around the meat, that's the way to think about it. Yeah. But again, I see it every day where people just stack stuff together, sure. and well, it's not going to cool. If a guy's hunting by himself now, archery season's coming yeah. up, you just shot a bull in the high country, a lot of people, i got to get my friend. I want pictures, yeah. blah, blah, blah. <laughs> the thing is, is, especially if you shot it in the evening, you got to get that. That's when you're going to go down with the gutless method. Yep. You should have quality game bags with you. I don't get the super porous bags because when you stretch it and put it on the meat, a fly can attach himself to the outside. The red meat's sticking through. You know the bag. They're cheap. Yep. Uh, the cheap you pay, cheap you get. That works yep. all everything in the world. <laughs> uh, when you see a real tight woven one that you can't see through, that's a great game. So that's the goal. We yeah. don't want to see through it. Exactly. And okay. you take those up with you, have a few of those in there, um, and you want to separate that hind quarter, get it in a tree. Then you can go back to camp, find yep. your buddy, come get it the next day. If you're going to hang it or camp, or you're going to hang it up 2,000 feet higher than when you're hunting, leave it there overnight. Yep. It'll yep. be fine. Maybe a bear's going to get it, which we see more of these yep. days. Uh, but at least it's going to get cool. Well, if yep. you leave it lay on the ground, I can guarantee you 9 out of 10 times, any animal that lays on the ground overnight is going to be bad. Out. And I have people every single year that bring me bad animals because they shot it late at night, they're we'll covered in the morning. Whatever. Yeah. We'll get him tomorrow. You see it on TV all the time. That We'll get him in the morning. When you go back, nine out of ten times that animal's rotten. You want to know if it's rotten? Separate him. In the hind, there's two sockets, one on each side. Yep. You cut into that socket, it's going to be discolored right there. That's where the bone sour starts. If it smells, there's nothing I can do. I can cut an animal that's dry or aged or has been molded on the outside because he was aged someplace for 20 days. I don't do it. I can cut that. But when an animal sours from the bone, he's souring from the inside, inside out. out. It, it could take 24 hours, and an animal is gone. Well, it would take 30 days to do in the cooler. To, to sour it to the point where you don't even want to eat it, where yeah. it goes bad. And it can happen that fast. And that, and we were talking about that, that once the, the bacteria starts, yeah, it, it do doubles what you said. Every, every hour, hour. Every hour it so doubles. So it, let's just say it's starting from the inside, from that hind socket, from the animal laying down for, say, eight hours in the sun where you let it, you know, Say you shot it too far back and you wanted to let it sit. If it actually you know perspires, it's done. And you let it sit 10 hours where those legs are laying together. Right. There's just so much temperature there. Yeah. It's rotting from the inside out. And that's where a lot of people will smell the outside. They're like, oh, it's still pretty good. But the yeah. outside doesn't matter. Like you said, you can have mold on the outside. That's no problem. Cut it off. You're good. Yeah. It's the inside where it where When it the bone starts. sours, it's gone. Okay. And, and within 24 hours, it yeah. can happen. Um, what you see on TV is a lot of guys, I think, trying to get a good shot, yep. uh, you know, recovering the game. And they're always asking, do you got it? Do you have it? You know, but in reality, in the real world, you shoot. If you shoot late at night, you it's better have it all to, night. Exactly. Just, I just plan on having a late night. I, the worst for me was a 4 a.m. Yep. That's when we finally got it in the in the truck. Oh, yeah. You know, and we like, all oh. had those moments. <laughs> <laughs> I like deer hunting better now. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. So, well, perfect. Those are things to think about. So again, think about that process of again cooling it off, harvesting it, walking through all of those steps. That's going to be huge. Hey, for Steve, you. while we're on the topic, sure. can you touch base on that aging? You kind of briefly said why you don't like it. Um, absolutely. Well, a lot of people say I want it to age and get more tender, but uh, I mean, it's it's a huge concept. I mean, everybody's like, man, this elk's good. I'm going to make it better. I'm going to age it. If you want a better elk, the shoot, shoot it before the rut, right? <laughs> no, no, yeah, if you take the same elk, if you shot you shot a big bull prior to the rut, they eat great. I do a lot of them yeah. from southern Colorado. Uh, we have rifle seasons that are going to open, ranching for wildlife yep. that open early. Them things are great eating. Yep. You take that same elk that's lost 75 pounds, gone through the rut, and has burned it off, it's tough. Is that what a bull will lose during the rut? Yeah, easy. 
Well, no therapy. Come on, they're, that's they're a fact right there that you never hear. Yeah, a big bull is seventy five pounds right, and what? And that's usually valuable fat and moisture content that they need. Yeah, I mean it's 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 this. If you take a beef, yep, off of the prairie, yep, and you harvest him, you kill him, whatever. That's called grass fed beef. Yep, they used to call those no rolls or select. Yeah, that's what it was called because it has no marbling. You take the same beef, you take him down to the feedlot, put him on a hundred day program, and fatten him. You got choice. If yep. you're going to really do it well, you got prime. Okay. And that's going to melt in your mouth, but that other one's going to eat just like, you know. Yep. And people yep. that buy grass-fed beef, you you better learn to hunt. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you can go shoot. I don't know if it's going to be any cheaper in the long run. <laughs> no, no, no. Definitely. You'll enjoy yourself. So, it, yeah, beef has marbling in it, the little white fat that you see at the grocery store, and it, you'll see a lot more of that little white fat yep. in there. Yep. And in the aging process, that fat breaks down, and the meat becomes tender. Uh, elk and deer, not so much. They don't I mean, have the fat content. Right, and there's a lot of recipes you can. A simple one is zesty Italian salad dressing. Yep. You got an elk that's a little bit tough for deer. Soak it in that overnight. Yep. It really helps. That's just a little bit of vinegar Absolutely. in there. But talking aging, you were saying you know, you have a a, a bull, good pre rut, rut, post rut, and you you've tested this. Yeah. Where you taste a piece the first day. It's tough. Then you've aged it 10 days. It's still tough. And you've tasted it. It's, it's still tough. I shot I shot a cow elk from the time we left the shop to when we were back was five hours. Yep. Shot, shot it down there by Larkspur. Yep. Um, me, myself, and another meat cutter yep. shot it through the head. Shot a goat that year. And Ryan cooked a steak off that elk. And it was a cow. Yep. And he goes, here's, here's that. And I goes, oh, man, them goats are terrible. And he goes, that's that cow. I goes, impossible. <laughs> Yeah, so people come to me like, oh, he got me my wrong animal. Yeah. I mean, you're sitting here, it, it comes running by and you shot it. What do you know about that elk? Yep. No, yeah, you seriously, know. where it's been, what it's been eating. <laughs> Definitely. I, I shot one in Evergreen from my friend George. Yep. He said, I want a good cow, and I was looking at the herd, and there was a shorter one. We went over there, didn't have no teeth. <laughs> I think it was so old, it shrunk. <laughs> and I, I said, well, so much for what I know. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. But no, so again, for everybody out there, you talk about aging. Generally speaking, I don't want to fight with you. I don't want to be like, yeah, I know, that, you know, you, you said it tastes better. But if you've ever aged one and felt it was better, more than likely, it was probably just a better animal. Oh, okay, Better exactly. food, things like that. You Generally speaking, aging is not going to help the process on wild game. It just, it just doesn't have the same... Body type doesn't have the same fat, just a different situation. Shoot, uh, shoot a Wyoming antelope and a Colorado antelope that's out east yep. in an alfalfa field. Just hang them up and back up 10 feet. There's a difference. You'll see the difference. Purple okay. meat or pink meat with a little white yep. exterior fat on it. Uh, my son lives in Nebraska and harvests quite a few deer every year. They eat so well. They're, are, they're on grain, basically. Yep. Same like a cow. Uh, more. I've yeah. never seen a cow be on grain. For That's a true. year or two and a half years yeah, when you yeah. finally shoot him. Yeah. So, I mean, this, the deer that come out of there, um, I get a lot of deer out of Texas, yep. and they put out corn. And, I mean, when those guys open those coolers up, if they've really been cornering them, I mean, it, they open the cooler, smell sweet. No kidding. Uh, okay. Yeah, exactly. It, it, no. it is what it eats. Absolutely. And that's what makes good beef prime. And poor beef, just grass-fed beef, yep. because it's and just, that, it's ranging. Yep. That's it. And the same thing with wildlife. So, again, keep that yeah. in mind. Uh, I promise you it's going to make you make a big difference. Right. Um, we're going to take a couple questions here in just a second. I want to get to a last couple questions. Um, big thing I want to talk about is freezing meat. So, this is a situation where, like, let's say you're a, a guide. Let's say you're on the family hunt, um, things like that. If you get a bunch of animals down, I'm always questioning myself do you know if i wanted to bring my elk my wife's elk my father's elk we want to bring you a big batch of four sure. animals is it a good idea to freeze refreeze thaw walk me through the process of freezing meat uh, not freezing yeah, meat. yeah that's kind of a, a fallacy people say yep and eat it again turkeys uh and thanksgiving everybody i gotta buy a fresh turkey like you think they killed that turkey <laughs> two days before and got it to the market you know i mean turkeys are slaughtered year round you know yep. as they're grown and then they Put them in just bags, freeze them. bags, and they freeze them. Then they thaw it out, and then you got that that type yep. of turkey. Um, people bring me meat all the time that they bone it out themselves. As soon as we open, which will be just right at the end of August, early September, there's people that didn't eat last year's meat. Yep, they bring that to me, and then we start all over again. So that meat's yeah. been frozen and thawed and frozen and thawed. What happens in a steak is if you freeze a steak and you thaw it, and it, it say it's in paper like we used to yep. see. And it's on a plate in the in the refrigerator, and it, the myosin, the blood comes out a little yep. bit. So now you're going to freeze that steak again. Yep. It's going to refracture it again, and it's losing that juice, which is the great flavor. The flavor. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. And there, and then again, another thing we always do vacuum. I don't know. Some people might still paper wrap, 
and the longevity of something that's paper wrapped, it's going to freeze or burn because the air can get in okay. where the paper uh, doesn't touch the meat yeah. and fold up tight. Um, if you want a paper wrap yourself, I'd suggest at home that you would wrap it in saran first. Okay. And, it, and that's going to be as tight as you can be. Yep. And then you could paper wrap it to identify it. Okay. And then we do vacuum, and I've tested it where I've left stuff two, three, four, five years in the vacuum. Yep. Just saying, I wonder what it's like. Yeah. And you thought, and it's great. Okay. As long as it, there is a chance, though, in your freezer when you're tossing this stuff you around. Make it. Every now and then, you, you might get a pinhole. And yep. you'll know <laughs> it because you'll get frost inside the package. You want to eat that one next. Yep. yep. Get, get it right away. Awesome. All right. All right. We're going to throw in a couple questions here. I know we got a lot of people uh, itching to ask some questions. So, uh, Devin, pitch us a question here. All right. First one. Uh, do you recommend cutting down the quarter to create a slit in the quarter to vent it? Have cool you... it off. Um, one on that is buffaloes, you know, on a bison. Yep. And a lot of people, I mean, the hump on a bison, that bone, where that yep. hump's at, is about 14 inches, that okay. bone. Yep. And so if you, yeah, you if you can take your knife in there and slide it down there, and it'll open that up, makes the world of difference on a okay. buffalo. But anything like that, again, if you want to make, like on the hind, if you were going to hang that hind leg up in the tree. Of an elk. elk. Yes, yep. exactly. Yep. Elk or deer, whatever. And you, before you put it in the game bag, there's there's those muscle groups that I talked about. You can put your thumb in there and run it and follow it. And if you open those up a little bit while you're working on the rest of the animal, it's going to cool. Yep. It's still vent cavities. You can't go wrong. Absolutely. Can't so, go wrong. Venting's not going to hurt. Try to put them in the right place. Uh, to hopefully help yourself out in the right stakes, and it'll, it'll go a long way. Mm -hmm. So, yes, venting, good idea. What about uh, sage-fed animals? Up in the high country, is that going to affect you? Hear it all the time. It, it is yeah. no, Absolutely. but it's a it's a truth. I mean, a, a mule deer buck when he ruts, they get strong, and I mean that deer's eating the sage because that's what's in front of him. Yep. I have never seen soybeans in Kremlin. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. and vice versa out there. Yep. He's got soybeans, wheat. I mean, my son's. I think to put a food plot. That's the whole thing's a food plot. Yeah, exactly. The only just, thing, just like anything, what they eat is gonna. It's gonna be it. There, okay. There's not much you can do for it, is there? I had a guy no. brought me a, a beef once, and he says this thing tastes like onions. The farmer was feeding it onions. Can you make jerky? I said sure. We made him all jerky. He said, how is it? I goes that tastes like onion jerky. <laughs> it's. <laughs> <laughs> it, it is what they eat. You know, Absolutely. there's no doubt. Absolutely. And uh, I just want to say, you want that different quality, honing a different unit is going to help you out. And that's huge. And the biggest thing here is with pronghorn. You know, you talk to people that say, I love pronghorn. You have people, I hate pronghorn. And more than likely, they're probably different animals. If the guy who hates it tasted the one that's eating grass, probably like hitting grain. You know what I mean? It's, um, yeah. A uh, lot of it is going to be somewhat what they're eating. Quick on that is, is times have changed. I'm, I'm born and raised in Colorado. I'm 64 right now. When my father used to hunt, it was a colder to come home and hang them in the garage. Yep. I don't like last year. Yeah, it, no wasn't, it wasn't going to happen. And I think the the problem with antelope is people don't they want to treat them like they might a deer in November, yep. where they gut them and throw them aside. Antelope is is fantastic if you ask me. It's the finest texture. It's similar to African animals. Yep. And but the thing about antelope, if you're hunting, it's 80, 90 degrees. Uh, you'll want to skin it right away, hang it up, maybe an hour just to get the, and then take it and lay it in layers of ice like that. And I'm going to say nine out of ten times you're going to you're going to say, well, antelope is really good. You can't beat antelope. It's just it's quality. Hard. That's how you're taking care of it. For me, I get most of my sausage and jerky orders come out of antelope. Okay. I mean, I'm grinding tenderloins all day yeah. long on antelope because people say, I don't, don't like antelope. Yeah. And you're not going to change their mind. And if they want, you know, whatever the guy wants, if he's good, and a lot of them make jerky so yeah. they can go elk hunt. So that's, it's good with me. But it's, I think a lot's got to do with antelope is the way you treat it. Yeah. And I believe that the antelope that we get in eastern Colorado yeah. are just really good, okay. you know, because they're, again, they're eating something. Eating something good. No, that's all good right. to know. We got one more here. Sure. Uh, what's the proper way to use citric acid when preserving meat in the field? There's a spray that you can put on that's supposed to help seal it, and I've never experimented with it. Okay. Um, I, if you just get the skin off of it, you'll see it start to get a sheen on there, and that'll help you somewhat, but from there I go right to my cooler. It's either going to hang in the game bag overnight, or I'm going to get it right back to there. Citric acid, I've never experimented with it. They, some people use it as a carcass wash. I don't. Okay. Vinegar, some people use vinegar to help kill a bacteria on the outside of an animal, which does work, but it still has a uh, residue or a smell sure. to it. Okay. Fair enough. Excellent. Now, before I let you go, the one thing I want to talk about to kind of wrap up the show, um, two things, actually, I should say that. Number one, I want to talk about meat in versus meat out. You're talking about the yield. You're talking about yeah. this. 
it's one of those things that I, I love to talk about because I hear so many people that, you know, I might have a first-time hunter and I send them to you. Sure. You know, and it's the friend request, and they're like, man, I picked up my animal, and I think that Steve screwed me. You know, I'm like, well, what'd you get? I just got jerky. I got all this jerky, and they're like, man, I brought in this whole deer, and I only picked up this sure. many bags. I don't think people understand, you know, the process. So I want you to just a quick general idea of, you know, what it takes to make burger, what it takes to make uh a sausage or a, a, a stick or jerky. Well, no, let's in and out. Type and, and start at the beginning on that. Um, a lot of processors just talk, charge by the animal. Yep. They'll say a deer. A deer is a hundred bucks. And I'm like, well, you got big deer, you got little deer. And <laughs> yeah. the reason they get away with that is if they just charge you by the animal weight like that, they don't have to have a certified scale. Okay. So when you come into our place um, in the drive-through, there's a yep. rail scale. Yep. And that that rail scale is six grand. Okay. Inside, there's another one where Karen, where she double checks that yep. they got it right. That's scale six grand. Okay. Okay. So that's a lot. So of, we're yeah. certifying everything. Yeah. There's, there's no there, one. Yeah, and all scales should have a little uh, a legend on there, a yep. sticker that's the state's inspected them. Yep. And you, it, to me, you want to weigh the animal in front of the customer because everything. Trust me, I've had animals that I thought weighed a lot more than <laughs> they do. You know, you're tired, and you find yeah. them. I think weighs four thousand pounds, but. <laughs> A big elk, to me, comes out of Evergreen, and we've yeah. shot some good ones. You yeah. shoot some good ones there. Carcass weight, 500, 515, yep. you know, 549 maybe. Yeah. Most of them that come out of the flat top stuff like that, a spike elk almost every time. If you bring me a whole carcass spike, he weighs 225. Is that, is that might, what it is? He might weigh 220, <laughs> might weigh 230. People think, man, this guy is good, but it's just you weigh so many. That's what they weigh. The yield off of that is going to be somewhere... 50%. You should, we should always okay. get you 50, hopefully 55%. Off so whole carcass. Yeah, so yeah. that's going to be your, your, your bone loss. Um, yep. uh, doe deer, probably 75 pounds, uh, a little button buck, skinned, legs, yep. guts out, stuff like that. He's going to weigh in the 80s. And occasionally we'll get a deer that weighs a little over 100. Okay. People talk about back east. I don't know. I've never been to. I've never I been see, to I, I do. Everybody talks, you know, they're 1,000 pounds. And I'm always yeah. like... No, nah, not really. <laughs> yeah, moose, and moose are not much much bigger than our elk. So yeah. we weigh them in there. You know, we weigh them on a certified scale so you have an idea of what it is. So if you brought me a 225-pound elk going out up front, you should have 120, 130 pounds of meat. Um, and you're saying, Russell, what are the yields? About a third of that carcass is going to be quality steaks. Okay. Um, you just asked me yeah. uh, about that whole loin that goes yeah. from his ears to his, his hind. Those are not all steaks, you know. Yeah. That front one third of that is neck meat, yep. and you don't want that it's in a steak. steak. Definitely, you know that's that's to me it's a burger, yep. and that's where it should end up. And then from the the back end, you've got your loin steaks, you got sirloins, inside tenders, and your rounds. There's a bottom round and a top round. Um, the front end, some people will say, "I want shoulder steaks." I'm like, "No, you don't. I won't. <laughs> I won't cut them." But there's other people that I see with their rubber stamp shoulder steaks. You know, yeah. To me, it's it ends up in out. I got maybe a two, three guys a year out of probably five to six thousand that don't want ribs. Okay. You know that I, yeah. I don't think they ever reorder them, but <laughs> they try you know, once. Yeah, if you want ribs, buy a pig. Yeah. Um, what else? So uh, yeah. let's say jerky. Yeah. What's it take to make two, a pound of jerky? Two to one. Two to one. So two, it takes two, two pounds to make one through the dehydration process right. to get one pound out, and that's one right. of the big things to talk about because guys will be like, "Hey, I gave him twenty pounds of meat, and you know I got ten pounds back." Sure. That's that process. Sure. Now, what do we gain on? Sausages, sausages. Um, sausages. So we're doing, we put pork, pork fat, and, and we put else. porks and a lot of spices. Yeah. Um, the spices that I came up, you can buy spices. You can go into a, a catalog and look and buy a little bag of spices yeah. and dump it in twenty five pounds of deer meat and stir it up, and they call that breakfast sausage. I don't call it breakfast sausage. You gotta cut it with pork, yeah. you know. And we put the pork we put in there is a fifty fifty, okay. and so they, if you melted it out, it would be fifty percent pork fat and fifty percent pork meat. Yeah. Yeah. And we cut that in like a. Uh, 65 pounds of meat and 35 pounds of that yep. and then so, uh, the spice there's a heavy percentage of spice okay. probably maybe almost 20 percent of it is okay. in a spice way you've got to put spice in it absolutely to, it doesn't you want to get that taste exactly it's not a four dollar bag of spice that's going to turn it into breakfast sausage yep. Yep. it's a lot of money absolutely and absolutely. but then you have a, a nice tasty product absolutely and that's something that you can eat every day you don't get sick of you don't get burned out and nobody's like what is that they were eating? You know, it tastes good. You, you, can't, buy it you can't buy it. No, I mean, we have people um, that, that taste this, and they're like, man, I'm, I'm strung out on this. I've got to have those cheddar dogs. Yeah. My <laughs> kids love cheddar dogs. And the greatest thing that we ever done was my wife was my tester. You know, and, and I, she'd always like, 
I'll eat that. And that's how I got started, is yep. Karen wouldn't eat like deer like it was. Yeah, yeah. And she goes, I'll eat them smoked German, and then people start having them. So consequently, this business got going. But what you, what the sportsman finds is if he can take that home, and his wife and the kids are eating it. He's like, yay. Exactly. Good uh, reason I, to get out there. I can spend. And there are certain people that are, that are cutting it themselves, and you know their wives and kids continue to hate it. And that's like like for me. If I eat it this much, you know, my kids, they want the hot dogs. They want the cheddar dogs and all that. Shake and, it up a little. If you have yeah. enough, you can eat it every day, and it doesn't get monotonous. A lot of people will do their own game. Yeah. I mean, they cut it up, and they, they come to me with 10 pounds of meat and yeah. say, I just need cheddar dogs. Yeah. And that's all they want, and that's okay. It, okay. It all, it's all good. You know, another, if you, if uh, one thing we, we missed out, try to line up a, a processor. If you I get this a lot, especially two guys go bow hunting for seven to 10 days. A guy shoots his deer on day two and he's going to stay with his buddy. I understand it. It's yeah. part of the pack. But if you're going to go hunt in some remote area, try to call a little town, Fruta someplace, Delta, yeah. and say, hey, you're a processing plant. Because a lot of those guys in the small areas, yeah. you can take it. You say, oh, tomorrow I'm going to take it down for X amount of dollars. He'll hang it in his cooler, and we can yeah. pick it up next Saturday. Absolutely. And they can cut it themselves. I don't do it in town just because of the volume yeah. that we do. Yeah. But a lot of little plants will do that. We'll do that. Right. And that, that's a really nice service. Yeah. So it keeps yeah. your animal from going bad, and you can stay up there and hunt with your buddy. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, guys, again, this is Steve Himes, Steve's Meat Market. We're going to wrap it down now, guys. Again, keep questioning. We can answer them afterwards. Uh, Steve, I appreciate your time coming Thanks, on. Thanks, Nate. Thanks guys, for having again, me. Again, if you want the highest quality meat and the processing, to go, everything goes with it right here. Go to stevesmeatmarket.com. Everything's available there. Make sure you check it out. And, guys, again, I am Nate Zielinski. Huge thanks to Bowtech Archery for letting us take over their live stream, letting us go live from there. Uh, Diamond Archery, Bass Pro Shops of Denver, uh, as well as everybody uh, locally here at Tightland Outdoors and the Nate Zielinski page. Huge thanks to everybody. Uh, stay tuned with us. Again, it is getting more serious. Everything is coming to play. We're going to have a lot more footage from us in the field over the next couple weeks. And again, hunting season is just around the corner. Uh, next week, I'll have more live scouting. I'm actually going to have a, a bunch of footage uh, from me this week out in the field. So we'll have a lot of updates for you next week. But make sure you stay tuned. Tag your friends. Bring your friends next time. Make sure you give this a listen. Uh, guys, we appreciate it. Your comments and uh, your situations is what we're driving this show for. So huge thanks to that, guys. We'll see you next week. Friends. Bring your friends next time. Make sure you give this a listen. Uh, guys, we appreciate it. Your comments and uh, your situations is what we're driving this show for. So huge thanks to that, guys. We'll see you next week.